guys, this is your um, your notes for the first section of uh, the Kennedy and Johnson years. All right. Um, let's see. This is the first uh, election that we're actually going to see a televised debate. We'll get to that on the next slide, but let's talk about the candidates first. Um, Democratic candidate in 1960 was John Kennedy. Um, uh, he was one of the youngest candidates in history, and uh, actually Mr. Nixon was a young candidate too. People just tend to forget that because Kennedy looks so much younger and because of the way that he uh, uh, responded in some of these televised debates we're going to talk about. So he kind of gets credit as being much younger than Nixon was, but really they were four years apart. This is the first time that both candidates have been born in the 20th century, so they were very young candidates, all things considered. Um, and then the Republican candidate, which I forgot to mention a minute ago, was Richard Nixon. The reason Nixon is running is Eisenhower is termed out. He had actually been Eisenhower's vice president, so going into 1960, he seemed to have um, quite a bit of the upper hand because he kind of felt like an incumbent uh, since he'd been the vice president before uh, that really wasn't. And Eisenhower had pretty good approval ratings. The 50s had been a good decade uh, overall uh, to most Americans. Uh, now they needed to pick a candidate and a president who was going to be the leader in the Cold War fight against communism. And Nixon did have experience um, in that arena, having been the vice president. They did grow up pretty differently. JFK had grown up pretty wealthy, and his family did have a political history. He had also attended Harvard, and he was a Catholic, and this was going to be the first time, if he was elected, that we had a Catholic president. And that may not seem like a big deal, um, but in 1960, it was a very big deal. Nixon grew up pretty differently. Uh, he did not grow up wealthy. He kind of had this chip on his shoulder that, as we'll see as we kind of move through this class, really dictates some of the decisions he makes. It explains his paranoia a little bit, which we'll talk about later on, uh, as I said. Um, but Kennedy and Nixon could not really have been more different uh, in their personal life uh, experience. All right, as I said, first time we had televised debates. They agreed to do four of them. Uh, during the first debate in Chicago, um, Nixon had been sick. Uh, he had been in the hospital because he had a knee infection. He had surgery, and then the incision got infected. And he was never really that sick, um, but just kind of traveling and being tired and being on the campaign, it just made him look very tired. And the fact that he led to that a little bit more. So when they got to the studio, he refused to let anyone put makeup on him because he just that just wasn't a thing that he thought about. And when you're under all those bright lights and you're going to sweat a little bit, plus he was sick, it just made him look even worse. And then you've got Kennedy, who kind of knew how to play that game. He looked younger and healthier. He obviously felt better that day anyway than Nixon. And people that watched the debate on TV believed without a doubt that Kennedy had won. However, people that listened to it on the radio um, really thought that Nixon had won. So it really was the first time in our history in terms of picking a president that you could have a totally different understanding of what had happened in a given um, debate based on how you watched it uh, or how you listened to it, which one. It was one of the closest elections we've ever had. Um, I'd say the only rivals would be the 2000 uh, presidential election between Al Gore and George W. Bush, um, which we'll talk about later on in this class, and then the 2016 election between um, Hillary, Clinton, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Uh, but anyway, in this one, uh, Kennedy did win. He won the popular vote by just a little bit. And then, most importantly, uh, he won the electoral vote, which is what you really need to get to be the president of the United States, which he got. Um, 
some of that came from his ability to react to unexpected events. As I said, both of these guys went into um, the 1960 election focused not on civil rights really at all. Uh, that wasn't something either candidate really wanted to get engaged in. Um, yes, we give Kennedy a lot of credit for being uh, engaged in that later on, but going into the, the campaign and into his presidency after he wins, that's not something that's really on his mind. They want to focus on the Cold War. But when something came up, like Martin Luther King being arrested, Kennedy did respond on the right side of history by helping him get out of prison. And that stunt, and a lot of people what, did think it was publicity stunt, um, and I think partly it was, but I think if you kind of look at JFK's record later on, I think he also did it because he knew it was the right thing to do. It just kind of worked out um, kind of on, in both ways for him. Uh, it won him a lot of support from African-American voters, and that very easily could have been what, what pushed him over the edge to winning the election. All right. The main thing we're going to really talk about in this section is the Cold War and some foreign policy issues that Kennedy had to uh, navigate. With the help of um, his, his think tank, as they were dubbed, the best and the brightest. So probably the most hated person in that group was uh, Robert McNamara. Um, which we'll talk a little bit about more later, but anyway, Kennedy's strategy was a flexible response. He didn't want to be pinned in to just one uh, foreign policy strategy, and that's why they came up with that term. Um, the goal was to reduce the possibility of nuclear war and getting yourself into a war because you're not looking at all the angles of what's actually happening. Um, he is going to make some mistakes, but he's also going to do some things right with this uh, plan going into it. All right. Eisenhower's defense policy had been massive retaliation, partly because it was the 50s and we were so far ahead of the Soviets in terms of our preparedness to deal with the nuclear war and how much better off we were economically after World War II, but also partly because Eisenhower was a military guy. That was... I mean, honestly, the reason he was elected president is because he was this World War II hero. So that was going to be where he tended to lean. Uh, Kennedy does not have that same type of military experience, and so that is not going to be what he tends to lean on. Um, so Kennedy did not ignore the possibility of nuclear war. He wanted to ensure the United States was prepared to fight both a conventional war and conflicts against guerrilla forces. And this is where... Uh, he really deviated from Eisenhower's plan, where Eisenhower had cut back on conventional troops to spend a lot of money um, creating nuclear weapons and updating, uh, you know, carriers to deliver those nuclear weapons. Kennedy balanced it out a little bit more. This gave increased funding to the conventional U.S. Army and Navy forces, and it also trained special forces such as the Green Berets, which we're going to see um, in Vietnam a little bit later on. <clears throat> All right. I'm actually going to skip this part on the Peace Corps and the Alliance for Progress. I do encourage you to go back and read it, but I want to focus on my presentation of this on uh, the Cold War crises that he had to navigate. So, first one, and really his first mistake that kind of led to his reaction on the other things he's going to encounter, is the Bay of Pigs invasion. Uh, as soon as he came into power, uh, by force, he overthrew Batista. Fidel Castro took steps to reduce the American influence on the island. He nationalized American-dominated industries, meaning he kicked the Americans out. Uh, early in the 19, early in 1960, Eisenhower authorized the CIA to recruit 1,400 Cuban exiles who were living in Miami, Florida, and begin training them to overthrow Castro. Um, in May of 1960, Castro established diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union, and the U.S. responded by prohibiting the importation of Cuban sugar. So, we responded by saying, if you want to recognize and be aligned with a communist country, we are not going to use our capitalism to support you and buy things from you. In 1961, 
The U.S. government severed diplomatic relations with Cuba, stepped up its pre preparations for an invasion of Cuba. Kennedy then gets inaugurated, and he inherits this plan that Eisenhower's government, and the CIA specifically, um, had created to train and equip this army of these Cuban exiles um, who had volunteered, not really knowing the full extent of what they were getting themselves into. And he had some doubts, but he was a brand new president. He didn't know the full extent of it. I think he trusted the CIA too much, trusted the Eisenhower outgoing administration too much. I'm not sure how much Eisenhower really knew about it. But anyway, um, so he decides to just kind of lean on the expertise that came before him with this plan, and he will never do something like that again. The first part of the Bay of Pigs invasion, and the reason it's called the Bay of Pigs invasion is because the part of the island they invaded was a bay called the Bay of Pigs. That's the only reason. Uh, but the plan was to destroy Castro's tiny air force, make it impossible for his military to resist invaders. So April 15th, 1961, a group of Cuban exiles take off from Nicaragua and a set of American B-26 bombers, painted to look like stolen Cuban planes, and conduct a strike against Cuban airfields. It turned out Castro and his advisors knew about the raid and had moved his planes out of harm's way. Frustrated, Kennedy began to suspect the plan uh, that the CIA promised would work uh, might be, in fact, a big, fat failure. But they went forward with it anyway. April 17th, the Cuban exile brigade began its invasion of an isolated spot on the island's southern shore, again known as the Bay of Pigs. They only made it about 20 miles inland uh, before they were completely overrun. Uh, the CIA had wanted to keep it a secret for as long as possible, but there was a radio station on the beach, which they didn't see, uh, and they were broadcasting over the radio every single thing that our Cuban exiles were doing, uh, so it was kind of like giving a play-by-play to everyone across Cuba, so it was very easy for Castro um, to shut down this attempted uh, coup. Before long, Castro's troops had pinned the invaders on the beach, exiles surrendered, and after less than a day of fighting, 114 were killed, 1,100 were taken prisoner. According to many historians, the CIA and the Cuban Exile Brigade believed Kennedy would eventually allow the American military to intervene again. They signed up for this without really knowing what they were getting involved in. They thought that the full American military was going to be right behind them, and that just was not ever a plan. So when it didn't work out, we just kind of left them to their own devices, and it's not the prettiest spot in America's history. The president was resolute as much as he did not want to abandon the Cuban communists, or the Cub abandon Cuba to communists, excuse me. He said he would not start a fight that might end up really being World War III because, you have to remember, Cuba is aligned with the Soviet Union, and so if we start fighting with them, it would be all too easy for the Soviet Union to begin fighting as well, and then before you know it, all the alliances are brought in, and we've got another world war on our hands. Since 1958, it's kind of switching gears here, actually going backwards, we're going to go over to Europe. Uh, since 58, Khrushchev wanted to sign a peace treaty that would put western zones of Berlin, so kind of think back to the end of World War II, the capital city of Berlin is technically in the eastern half of Germany, <clears throat> because Germany is split into two different countries, right? But since Berlin is the capital city, they split Berlin in half as well, okay? And so East Berlin belonged to the communists. In West Berlin, even though it's surrounded by communism on every side, that half of the city belongs to the non-communists. Okay, um, So Khrushchev wanted to do away with that. This was due in large part because a lot of East German workers were moving to West Berlin. Okay, So when they start that Berlin Wall, it's not necessarily to keep West Berliners in the city, even though the wall really goes all around the city, the most protected part is that part between the eastern and western half of Berlin. Okay, um, It was to keep the East Germans in, to keep them from leaving uh, that half of the city. At a conference in Vienna, 
the situation escalated. Khrushchev called the current situation intolerable, demanded the U.S. to recognize the formal division of Germany, remove the military presence they had, basically give up that half of the city um, to communism. But Kennedy refused to do it. So when Khrushchev gets home, that's when the Berlin Wall starts to go up and it becomes this physical symbol of this iron curtain that divided um, Western Europe and Eastern Europe. All right, going back to Cuba now. After seizing power in the Caribbean island nation of Cuba, leftist revolutionary Fidel Castro aligned himself with the Soviet Union. Under Castro, Cuba, Cuba grew dependent on the Soviets for military and economic aid, partly because we withdrew all of our economic support from Cuba after he takes over. The two superpowers plunged into one of the highest, or one of their biggest Cold War confrontations after the pilot of an American U-2 spy plane was making a high altitude pass over Cuba, and he photographed a Soviet SS-4 medium-range ballistic missile being assembled. So, for the American officials, the urgency of the situation stemmed from the fact that nuclear-armed Cuban missiles were now being set up 90 miles from Florida. Kennedy ultimately decided on a more measured approach. He didn't want to invade Cuba to take out these missile systems, even though he knew 30 million Americans might die if they decided to launch it. Um, instead of doing that, potentially starting World War III, and all of his advisors wanted him to. He was the only one who did not want to do that. He decided he was going to have the Navy blockade the island of Cuba, so surround it and keep any other Soviet... Uh, ships from getting in. Um, and then secondly, he was going to deliver an ultimatum uh, that the existing missiles had to be removed. So during the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was a 13-day political and military standoff in October of 1962 over the installation of nuclear-armed Soviet missiles, um, the United States and Soviet uh, tension grew stronger and stronger, and really over that nearly two-week period, um, most Americans thought we were on the brink of nuclear war, and we were. In a TV address on October 22nd, Kennedy explained, or notified Americans, um, about the presence of the missiles, explained his decision to put up the blockade, and made it clear that the United States was prepared to use military force if necessary. Following the news, many people feared the world, like I said, was on the brink of nuclear war. So this is, I mean, picture the threat of a snowstorm, right? And Sky took people rushing to the store to stock up on canned goods. Uh, this is when people who had fallout shelters were stocking those and getting ready to jump inside so that they wouldn't be killed if a nuclear attack came. Or ducking cover drills at school. All of that stuff really heightened over that two-week period. The disaster was avoided when the United States agreed to Khrushchev's offer to remove the Cuban missiles in exchange for the United States promising not to invade Cuba, and then Kennedy also privately agreed to remove um, U.S. missiles from the country of Turkey. Both Americans and Soviets were happy, honestly, that the Cuban Missile Crisis ended the way it did. The following year, a direct phone line or a hotline was installed between D.C. and Moscow, so that if something like this happened in the future, they could immediately speak to each other over the phone and not have to go through uh, ambassadors and emissaries and waiting for things like that to get delivered. October 7, 1963, JFK signed the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which was accepted by the Soviet Union and the U.K. Khrushchev also lost a significant amount of support, though, uh, in the Soviet Union for his actions during the crisis because a lot of members of the Soviet Union saw this as the first time they really had the United States uh, in a position of fear and desperation and Khrushchev wisely avoided a nuclear war and, and the death of a lot of people, not just Americans, but that ended up losing him a lot of support in the Soviet Union. So he is going to lose re-election when that comes up for him. Last little slide here. This just shows you, uh, first of all, the picture that our U-2 spy plane got that showed the nuclear warheads. Now, they weren't armed, okay? That is an important detail here. 
Um, and I'm actually going to post a video that will show you some more of this. You'll get to hear some recordings of President Kennedy talking to McNamara and other members um, of his um, advisory council kind of discussing what to do um, in Cuba. There's the island of Cuba up there on the top left, and it shows you the places where the missile bases were installed. Okay, And then it shows you kind of our blockade where we were. And then the picture on the top right shows you the scale, depending on where they launched uh, uh, one of those medium-range ballistic missiles from, where it could have hit the United States. And then the circles that you see around that kind of looks like a wave, or if you drop uh, like a drop of water where it would ripple effect to, that shows you the fallout um, from each of those potential um, hits on the United States. And it's got some cities lit up. So any one of those really would have hit at least part of Oklahoma. All right. That is where we're going to stop today. Um, I will upload a Section 2 video as well, but this is where I'm going to stop for Section 1. You do have a checkpoint quiz over this section that will be uploaded on Google Classroom. Uh, make sure you check Google Classroom as well for a link to a video um, that explains everything covered in this section with the exception of the election of 1961.